I serve as a park ranger at a park that seems to have far more playground than actual park, which means there's tons of child traffic most days. But of course, my most days. This was back in the year of 2018, long before any crazy pandemic of any virus. There was even more on the weekends and on days that school was out. I'm older now, so my kids are grown and gone. So I enjoy my job when I got to see kids nearly every day. They didn't really seem to notice me though. I just kind of blended into the background, which is why it caught my attention one day when, on a very busy weekend, there was a little girl at the far end of the park that was smiling and waving at me. I looked around to make sure she wasn't waving to a friend or a parent or something, but no, she was looking straight at me and waving. I smiled and went back, kind of chuckling to myself, since most of these kids don't pay me any mind. My mood seemed lighter for the rest of the day after that. The following day, which was Sunday, there was just as much of a population of kids at the playground that were all scattered about, and I remember to my surprise there was that same little girl that had waved at me the day prior. She waved and smiled just as enthusiastically. My heart melted and I waved back. After all the stuff I saw in various areas of law enforcement spanned over the years, things like that restored my faith in humanity. I got two days off and came back on a Wednesday. Making my rounds as usual, there were some kids, just not as many. A very common feat during the weekend and weekday. But I came back to that one playground and there was that still that same little girl smiling. She was always wearing that same outfit and she was standing in the exact same spot. That's when I began to feel differently and even felt an open pit in my stomach. So, I smiled and waved back to her, when I noticed that she never stopped smiling, or waving. The only thing that seemed to have changed is that she was smiling bigger than the very first time that I saw her, and maybe she seemed more thin. She was near, back to a cluster of bushes that seemed to be right next to the general area but were actually a bit further back. I decided to approach her to see what the real issue was. And as I did, I was hit with a horrifying odor. The stench of death and rotting flesh. And there's a rope that was tied around her neck and her left arm in such a way that she would stand upright and have her arm raised slightly. When the bush swayed in the breeze, she looked like she was waving. Without getting into any gruesome details, she had been horribly mutilated to show that she was smiling and waving. Again, since I dealt with children, this made me disgusted. I got very dizzy, and I had to sit down. How was I the only one who had seen her since Saturday? I immediately called out and filed a report. Even my superior thought my story was strange and even suspicious because they too wondered how I was the only one who had seen her. I wish I had a better explanation, and I feel like there were two deaths during the whole situation, hers and my faith in people. I've been a ranger for well over 30 years, and at some point, they decided that they would take some of the workload off my feet and let me do most of my work at the visitor center which is about a third of the way into the natural reserve. My body appreciates their consideration for the condition that I'm in, but my mental health doesn't. Keeping on the move and always on patrol was my way of coping with things. Working out of the visitor center gave me more time to think, and that's not necessarily a healthy thing. Suffice to say, I'm divorced, and my kids, well, they don't want to talk to me all while I'm facing my twilight years all by myself. I'm not trying to draw attention here. Those will be necessary details in just a few short seconds. They forced me to take coffee breaks if I had to go too hard for too long. 
I was taking one such compulsory coffee break on one of the outdoor wooden park benches, completely by myself. People don't come to the park to look around the visitor center anymore. Besides the brochures of park information, the only thing the park has to offer is the same four or five fun facts, and they've been hanging out for a long time. In fact, everybody has seen them. Nobody wants to see them again. I was quickly yanked out of my thoughts when I heard a voice that I hadn't heard for over 15 years, but recognized it instantly. It was the voice of my ex-wife, and she was calling my name. My brain was trying to come up with a rational explanation as to why I was hearing this, and then I heard my daughter's voice come out to me also, except she didn't sound like the 43-year-old woman that she had grown into. Instead, she sounded exactly the way she did when she was around nine years old. I was anchored to the park bench for a while, terrified to move, just in case I was having a heart attack or a stroke or experiencing something else that would mess with my mind. Perhaps I was dying. Perhaps this was a practical joke. But who could mimic those voices so well and know my name at the same time? I decided to try a more tactical approach. I would come towards the voices, but I wouldn't answer them. There were long pauses between each call, as if my wife and daughter were waiting for me to answer. But then they would call out again, and it was in those moments that I would pick up on the direction that they were coming from. Unless my ears were lying to me, it sounded like they were coming from the woods that came right up against the physical building of the visitor center. I stepped to the trees quietly, resting when there was silence, and walking when I heard the voices. I approached the opening in the trees, and they couldn't have been more than 14 feet in diameter. It was also clustered by some low-growing shrubs. I remained hidden as best as possible. It didn't sound like the voices were coming from nearby. They were coming from that very small clearing. I didn't see how it could be possible. If my wife and daughter were there, they'd be visible, clearly, unless they were lying down while in the shrubbery. So I stared for what felt like forever. But then a shape slowly rose out of the growth, and it appeared to have two large black eyes that were proportionate to its head, the same way the eyes of a fly are proportionate to its head. Everything about it was just a little too long. The neck, the shoulders, the arms. It did not stand up to its full length, just high enough to get a good look around before opening its mouth and speaking with both the voices of my wife and my daughter in one, calling out to me, asking where I was and what was taking so long. Then, without noticing me, it slowly sank back down. I could see its pale ribbed back bent over and underneath topmost of the leaves, where it did its best to try and stay hidden. I took out my pistol and I shot as many times as I could before I realized that there was a problem. At least two good hits hit on its flesh before it sprang up and ran. I don't know if the other three or four shots hit. Miraculously, I was able to slip back into the center and not have to offer an explanation to anybody important. The older girl there that works behind the front desk asked if she had heard something dangerous and I just told her that I saw some kids setting off fireworks. My ex-wife may be many things, but somebody with the ability, let alone the intelligence, to send some strange forest monster after me and lure me out with the sound of her voice isn't one of them. After that incident, I've kind of given into the urging of my superiors to spend more time in that area and less time tromping around outside. There are clearly more forces at work in this world that know more about me and know me better than I know myself. And the less I have to tangle with them, the better. I apologize in advance for my story being so long, but I figured I would give you the unfiltered version. Thank you.
the park that I service gets little to no traffic anymore. Part of that is simply because of how small the town is. Another part of that is today's Americans just don't get out for the fresh air anymore. It's kind of sad, really. I see video games are the new fresh air of today, and tablets and phones and electronics. A lot of them involve getting out into the wild and enjoying fresh air and hunting and surviving. Nobody is really into that anymore. People would rather literally pay money for a simulation than they could just go out themselves and do it. And yet, even as little traffic as our park gets, I still find just enough litter to make me irritated. As if people get out into nature just long enough to ruin it for everyone else. I was cleaning up some wrappers off a park bench when, among them, I noticed something different. There was one of these corn husk dolls, the kind that are fashioned after the type that Native Americans used to make. It didn't have a face, just a blank knob for a head and four nubs for arms and legs. Cute and creepy. And I thought to myself, until I noticed a small piece of paper rolled up and tucked into one of its folds. I unrolled it out of curiosity and it said hello there. I smirked and threw it. After I was done picking up all the trash, I went back to my patrol car when there was another corn doll stuck behind the handle of the door. It too had another message that it read, I said hello. I kind of prickled and looked around. As far as I could tell, I was the only person in the park and I hadn't seen nor heard anyone. But then again, I was very absorbed in my work when I was picking up trash. It's possible that somebody was watching me and playing an elaborate prank just so they could do it for, you know, giggles. Still, I didn't like to think that somebody had gotten by me like that. I quickly got inside my car, shut the door, and no sooner had I done that I noticed a third doll sitting on my steering wheel, also having another note that said, Could you use a hand? I nearly soiled myself when something smacked into the windshield. It took a second to fully register, but I realized it was a severed arm and hand cut off at the elbow. Immediately, I radioed out that we had something going on in the park and the response came fairly quick, as you would suggest and expect. But I wasn't sure if it was soon enough to keep whoever this was inside the park. I brought everybody up to speed, and there was a very thorough sweeping. They didn't find anything. No body, no killer, nothing. Not even another doll. Forensics even did tests on the severed arm, and unfortunately found that it belonged to a child that had been missing for over two months. The arm that hit my windshield is relatively fresh, so that meant the kid had died recently. The rest of the day kind of went by in a haze. I felt like a failure for not catching this monster, and all the moments that I could have when he was tampering with my car. Again, we never found anything, and the person was never caught. It's a mystery that will always be left as just that. A mystery. As a park ranger, I have seen a lot of odd things in my time. We get people that come out here for all sorts of reasons, especially in the camping area when it's off season. I've stumbled across all sorts of weird stuff, but so long as that weird stuff is legal and consensual, if you get my drift, then that's up to them. No judgment. Most of them can't even look you in the eye the next morning, and we just have a small chuckle about that. As I said, if you are consenting adults, it's your own business. But, one time, I came across something that ended up being a police investigation. You see, I was out and about, performing one of the last evening patrols before heading home for the night. We had three tents booked in that night, and it was getting towards winter when the camping area would be closed. Two couples had appeared, and one family with a mother 
dad, and two small babies. The tents were fairly spaced out, and just before midnight, everything was quiet. I had just finished up, heading back to the office to sign off, when I saw a young girl, probably no older than 18, run past me. She was just in her underwear, and from the quick flash I saw of her face before running off to the trees, she was terrified, all wide-eyed and mouth ready to scream. Immediately, I turned around, showing my flashlight in the direction she'd ran off to. There was nothing. I headed that way and looked all around, calling out even. Nothing. I recalled the three ladies that were booked into the campsite. They were all older. The mom was likely in her later 30s, and the two women in the couples were around their mid-20s, I would think. There was no good reason for a young girl to be running around in the dead of night when it was freezing cold. So, I went through protocol and alerted colleagues and police. They headed out and conducted a more thorough search woke the campers who were not happy that the babies had been disturbed, but there was no trace. Literally, no trace. I'm talking zero footprints where I'd seen her. No apparent way in or out that showed any evidence somebody had even ran through here. And no reports of missing teen girls or bodies showing up. I was relieved, but at the same time, not exactly sure what I saw. It did leave the question of what the hell did I see, or did I possibly hallucinate it? I guess time will tell. A couple of years ago, I was sat, filing out some paperwork in the office, when a call comes in on the radio, telling me I think I'd better get down here ASAP. I just remember thinking that somehow... They must have known I just sat down for a minute with a fresh pot of coffee. But, a colleague calls through something like that. You better go check it out. I'm a ranger out in SoCal, and we have a massive expanse of parkland that we look after. So, after jumping in the truck and heading off to the area, one of the rangers had also been checking in on to see what we got. We have an official camping area out here, which is super busy and is ran and looked at and after by a separate team. We don't tend to get involved with that much, but we do, however, find the occasional off-site camper in the woods that we have to remove for their own safety. People, or idiots, don't seem to realize that there is a reason why there is a safe campsite and although you can hike through designated areas, there is plenty of wildlife out there that would very much like you for an appetizer. So I pull up the truck to the spot my colleague is waiting, and my heart sinks when I see the tents. I was asked if I looked inside, and I can now see my colleague turning a little green. He told me I better take a look. I just remember thinking how bad it could possibly be. I mean, the tent, from the outside at least, hardly even looked disturbed. There were no apparent rips in the material, or obvious signs of any animal activity, let alone violent activity or struggle. But as soon as I opened the zipper, the smell hit me like a hammer to my face. Blood, and a lot of it. But that's it. No body, no belongings, not even a sleeping bag. Nothing. Just a tent full of blood. We had the police come, and they did their thing. Did a massive search of the area, and although how anything would have survived that much blood loss, I don't know. But where was the body? That site was a potential homicide location. There was also no blood trails outside of the tent. No footprints, tire marks, or anything other than from us. Speculation was that the body was killed in that tent and then drug off, but once again, there were no markings or indications in the soil or ground below us to show any of that. 
The cops let us know a while later that after doing tests, it was indeed human blood, but having no match whatsoever on the system to who it belonged to. So, that's another park ranger tale we'll never know what the hell happened. I was working as a ranger this one time when I heard something pretty weird from one of the campers. It was low season and we only had a few bookings. One, a group of boy scouts and their two leaders who were both middle-aged moms. Two, a very small church group, all female. And three, two college girls who had been doing some sort of nature photography shoot and research had appeared. So, a lot of females aside from a small group of young Boy Scouts. There were around five of them, and I'd say they were all preteen. That's important to note for the story. You see, in the morning, while the Scouts were cooking their breakfast, and the church ladies were doing their prayer circle, one of the college girls came storming over to the office, making and filing a complaint. She said that there had been a man outside their tent during the night. They knew it was a man, as he mumbled a couple of things and laughed. He'd had apparently a very deep voice. She said he was drunk, and that he had urinated on the side of the tent. Again, not only from the voice, but the height of where the urine had hit the tent. they known it was a guy, and not one of the little boys. Sure enough, I headed over to their tent at the location they said it happened. And sure enough, there was a strong smell of human urine. There were also three empty beer cans on the floor and multiple cigarette butts. No one on that site claimed to have brought any alcohol with them, and none of them seemed like secret drinkers, and there had been no sight or smell of tobacco. Thing is, our campsite is miles away from anywhere. You would have to drive to get here, and there were no obvious signs of anybody else coming onto or through the site. It was enough to freak everybody out, and they all packed up and left. Can't say I blame them. We kept watch overnight for the next week or so, but never saw anything, and never had any more complaints. Maybe the girls just made the whole thing up. I don't know. It didn't feel like it, though. And between the beer cans, cigarettes, and urine smell, it seems like a lot to waste your time on and a lot of a story to build up. For what? Sometimes, some of the scariest things don't necessarily have to be a torn up body or tons of blood. They just have to be unexplained. So, I work for the forestry department and I often travel around, conducting various bits of research. I've gotten to travel far and wide, often ending up in the most remote and often beautiful places that would be extremely unlikely to see your average Joe ever go to. Unless, like me, it was something to do with their job. Therefore, when you find something in one of these spots that has very obviously been left by a person... There is absolutely no rhyme or reason for it. You can't help but jump to nefarious conclusions. So, when you're out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, up in the ass end of Canada, with nothing around for miles, and you find a bed, it's kind of weird, if not downright unnerving. And I want to be clear. I don't mean like some leaves and twigs something somebody had created as a bed for themselves. I mean an actual single wooden bed, complete with rotten, moldy mattresses. Multiple mattresses. Can you think of a singular reason why that would be there? There are no houses or any sort of building structures that used to be or are still there for miles and miles. In fact, the nearest road, I believe, is about 46 miles away or, in Canadian, 46 kilometers. There were no recent tracks except mine. Although from the state of it, 
it did seem like it had been there for a very long time. It seemed like a very unusual place, just to dump a bed you didn't want anymore. And also, why? Who would haul a bed all the way out here? I ended up alerting the cops, wondering if maybe it had been used for a crime and dumped out here since it was unlikely anybody would ever find it. Or maybe this was some kind of gang kill location. It seemed rather implausible, and thankfully, I couldn't see any obvious stains in the bed or around it, but who knew? I've never heard back about it, so I guess it wasn't the missing puzzle piece in some nationwide serial killer hunt. But I still can't think of a single good reason why it would have been there. One of the scariest things that has ever happened to me occurred while I had to take a bunch of kids from the local church group camping. I was only around 18 at the time, and one of the youth leaders of the group, mainly because it was going to look good on my college manuscript. There was around 10 little kids. Me and another youth leader, we'll call her Tammy, and then two adults, Mr. and Mrs. Love. That really was their name. They ran the Sunday school, and this was an overnight treat for the kids, who were all pretty young. I want to say around 8 to 11. We did all the usual camp stuff until it got to the evening. While roasting s'mores, one of the kids asked for a ghost story, but Mr. Love said he wasn't going to scare them. I guess the Bible is scary enough. But to make up for no spooky stuff, he would allow a quick game of manhunt in the dark, as long as they all stuck to in and around the tents and the first row of trees if he blew the whistle. They all came straight back, and whether they'd been found or not, Mr. and Mrs. Love and two of the kids would be seekers, and Tammy and I would hide along with the rest of the kids. I figured since I wasn't ten, I could bend the rules ever so slightly. I ran back a bit further into the trees. I planned to sneak out when I thought I was close to being the last to be found. Feeling pretty smug, as it was really dark back here, and there was no way I'd be found until I sprang out. It was super quiet, as all the kids were desperately trying not to give away their hiding spot. It became really obvious when I heard the sort of banging noise behind me as it amplified, all throughout the trees. I just remember thinking, I'm going to be given away by a raccoon or something, or a possum. There was some rustling, and then all of a sudden, I was blinded as the thing making the noise flipped on a light. I don't think I've ever been so terrified or screamed so loud in my life. There was a guy who stood behind me, only I couldn't see his face properly, like he had a stocking over it kind of like how you see in the movies about bank robbers. As soon as I screamed and saw him, he ran. I just stood there screaming until Mr. Love suddenly appeared from the other side and grabbed hold of me, asking what had happened. Was I hurt? He took me back to camp at that point, as I could just speak. I was so scared. When we got there, and this had all taken just a few moments, Everybody was back. I told them what I'd seen, and all the kids began crying. The adults knew me well enough to know there was no way I would make something like this up. So, Mrs. Love called the cops on her cell phone, while Mr. Love got everybody to huddle together and put all of her flashlights on. The police showed up and checked out the area. Of course, it was super hard to see anything in the dark, but they checked pretty thoroughly, and I even showed them the exact spot that I had seen the mysterious man. There was no trace of him or anybody else, and they ended up helping to drive all the kids home, as really nobody wanted to spend the night. The next morning, they went back again, just to check for any evidence in the daylight. Now, 
they were able to see a ton of weird carvings that had been very recently cut into the trees, and several bullets and other sharp objects found on the floor near to where I had apparently been standing. Had I possibly disturbed a would-be mass murderer? Those are one of the things that will haunt me forever, knowing that I could have been killed. It happened five years ago. The official ruling was that his death was caused by a rogue bear attack. You know, when a bear gets a little too used to eating human food, so it doesn't feel threatened anymore and attacks a human? They all know it wasn't a bear, though. Bears don't leave wounds like that, and they sure as hell don't pose the body 70 feet up in a dead tree. Yeah, I said pose, but before I get into the details, I should explain a bit about myself now. I'm a park ranger in a very popular national park in the northern United States. I don't want to say exactly which one, although I doubt I'll keep my job for much longer anyway. That's partially why I'm posting this. I need to tell somebody else about this story, and like I said, my colleagues don't want to talk about it. Being a park ranger has given me a lot of weird stories, and everybody is used to weird shit happening in the woods. But this was on a completely different level. For days, we had been getting reports from campers and hikers about strange noises coming from a section of deep backcountry forests, growls, yipping, even human-sounding voices. Equipment and food had been going missing from backcountry campgrounds. All pretty typical stuff that can be explained away pretty easily. Many animals thieve food, make weird noises, and even the human voices can be explained by the sound that foxes and mountain lions make at night. But we needed to investigate either way, because an animal that is conditioned to human food is dangerous. So... We sent our veteran backcountry ranger, Craig McKay. This guy had been working there for 30 years, was an expert outdoorsman, and was my mentor when I first started. As always, he jumped into the task, always eager to go into the backcountry, even though he was getting a little older. I'll pause now and let Craig tell the rest of the story. Well, his journal will have to tell the rest of the story because he isn't alive to tell it. I found his journal, a flashlight, and his backpack inside a small cave near the location of his body. A couple of days after he didn't return and we had sent out a search party to find him. I haven't shared this journal with anyone, not even the other rangers, until now. I'm not exactly sure why I've kept it hidden, other than that the truth seemed so messed up and unreal. I didn't want it to damage people's memory of Craig. I'm not even sure if I believe it myself. Everything what I'm going to read to you had written down over the two days he was out on his backcountry excursion. October 21st, 2011. Day 1. Today was a long day, and I can't say that I've made much progress. I've hiked about 15 miles over the course of the day, starting down in the gully, where the reports first started and ending up at my current camp, which is on the southwest side of Bald Knob. I figure it's a good enough place to keep an eye out for anything coming and going through the valley. Earlier, I found some tracks in the ground in the area, and as close as I can tell, they're from a mountain goat. Odd that it would travel alone, but maybe it was separated from its herd, or dying? It had an odd gait. I followed them for a while, but... They didn't lead anywhere, so I abandoned them. Near the tracks was a pervasive smell of death, and I'm assuming a goat got separated and died. Tomorrow, I'm planning to hike across the valley to the mountain on the opposite side and see if I can't catch a track of whatever is harassing the campers. October 22nd, 2011. Morning of Day 2. Quick note while I eat breakfast. Last night was a long night, one of the longest I've had in a while. About an hour after going to bed, I heard light steps near the campsite. I grabbed the rifle and went out to investigate. No lights, so my eyes could stay adjusted to the dark. The second I stepped out of my tent, the noise stopped. 
Whatever was there knew that I was watching. I made a couple of circles around the campsite and found nothing, but I could feel something watching me from the shadows. As I got back into my tent, I thought I saw a tall silhouette in the clearing, but I must have just been seeing things. It was too skinny to be a bear, and nothing else is that tall. The strong scent of death was still present and kept me wary all night. Today's mission has changed. I just got a radio call that a couple of hikers haven't returned when they were supposed to last night and might be lost. I'm still crossing the valley today, but this time to reach where the hikers were supposed to be last. October 22nd, 2011. Night of day two. Stopped for the night in the valley. Cooking dinner now. Chicken and rice again. Dead tired and I'm getting too old for this. No progress on the hikers and still smells like death, though much stronger than before. I've just heard some sounds that sound like they could be voices. I can't get the radio to work in this valley. Looks like I'm not getting dinner tonight after all. Going to take a light pack and see if I can follow these voices. October 22nd, 2011. Night of day two. Second entry scribbled. Dear God, what did I find? Barely made it to this cave. I can hear it scratching and gurgling outside. Going to try and block the entrance and see if I could stay here overnight. I found out where the smell of death came from. Got the cave entrance cracked covered with a large rock and some brush. It will have to do. The beast is still outside clawing at the crack in the rock. Don't think I'll sleep tonight anyway. Not after what I saw. I might as well record this because these might be my last words. For the first time in my career, I'm scared. I don't even know what I saw. It was huge, about seven and a half feet tall, impossibly fast. Smells like putrid meat. Earlier when I had left camp, the voices outside became more and more persistent. They were definitely human voices. I followed them until I reached the clearing, and suddenly, everything went silent. No voices, no hikers. It sounded like the forest itself was holding its breath. I heard a slight sound behind me before I was thrown off my feet. Knocked the wind out of me. My rifle was ripped from my hand before I could even use it. I was picked up by my leg and thrown across the clearing. I could feel its claws digging like knives into my muscle. The thing dragged me up right against the tree, and I could feel its breath on my neck, breathing out a putrid smell. I could feel the blood pouring from my leg and soaking into my pants. The agonizing pain from the wound left me trembling. I could feel the weight of its body as it pushed up against me, ready to go in for the kill. I heard the smack of its mouth opening and prepared myself to die when a crash in the distance distracted the beast long enough for me to make a break for it. I ran for my life, and I didn't look back but knew it wasn't far behind me. About 20 feet away was the entry to this cave that I was able to squeeze into. It's still outside. I could hear it shuffling around, trying to get into the crack, and I could hear the heavy breathing, the sucking, gasping sound coming from its mouth. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Dear God, please help me out of this. I want to see my wife again. I want to see my kids again. My nose is filled with the putrid smell of impending death. If I make it through the night, my plan is to wait until first light and try to escape back to the ranger station. Those are the last words we have by Craig McKay. When he never reported back, we assumed his radio had gone out of range, but after a couple of days, we sent a search party to find him. Well, we found him all right. From the tracks, it looks like Craig left the cave early the next day. He makes it about 50 feet from the cave entrance when a second set of tracks catches up to him. Goat tracks. More specifically, a goat with only two legs. The gate matches something that would be a bit more than seven feet, like Craig described in his journal. What we found of Craig was 
dragged 70 feet up a nearby tree and torn to pieces. He was hardly recognizable. His torso was jammed onto a short branch on the tree that kept him hanging there. His arms splayed out to his sides. His innards were strewn around the base of the tree. The jagged, shattered remains of his leg bones stuck out of the early snowfall that had come to the mountains this year. Nothing appeared eaten or missing, but not a single piece of him was left untouched by the monster. It took the rest of the day and a special rope team to get him down. The missing hikers were never found, though scraps of clothing matching what they were wearing had been found in the same valley where Craig died. Like I said earlier, the official story is a bear attack. Bears don't do this. We don't know what did this. We've rerouted trails to stay away from this area, but we still hear reports of human sounding voices coming from the woods, and we've had some more hikers than normal go missing in the last five years. Some are found, but it's always too late. Some are arranged like Craig was. Broken warnings to other hikers who dare intrude upon the beast's forest. Some are just never seen again. So, I quit my job as a park ranger a few days ago. Not because I got tired of it, it's because I've seen some crazy shit. I wasn't one of those park rangers that stand around or sit in a shack. I was the kind that were bound to towers, taking radio calls, and more. So it was a normal day just sitting, looking out for any strange things. You may be asking strange things. When I first got the job, they informed me of strange entities and happenings, those I still do not know to this day. As day started setting, I got a radio call from the other tower. Yes, I had the night shift that day. The man at the tower, or Chris, told me he's heading home, and just a reminder to look out because night isn't pretty. As I see his lights turn off of the tower, I knew that my shift started. Nothing really happens when you work the night shift, but this specific day was strange. I was sitting next to the park map they left us when I hear static coming from the radio. I knew someone was trying to contact the tower, so I walked over. Before I had time to respond, a scared, out-of-breath man was on the radio. Hello, I heard. I did the standard procedure. This is Tower 4. What seems to be the problem? Finally, someone help, the man said in relief. I, I was on the trail when I heard something behind me. Any more information, I asked him. Yeah, I, I started to speed up when I did it. It sounded like something was running after me. As soon as I heard it, I started running. Stay on the line, I said. I opened the instruction manual I was reading, the part about hikers being chased by an animal. As I was reading, I heard a scream over the radio. Hello, do you copy, I said. Help, whatever was chasing me is still chasing me. Keep running, but where are you? The lake. That's near tower two. Head to the nearest tower. We always leave the towers open, because when the shifts are over, they are required to unplug and put the radio in the locked box. Yeah, that's dumb, but it's how it works. As I return to the radio, I hear a scream from the radio and outside. It sounded like somebody was getting murdered. Hello, where are you? I hear on the radio. I lied for my safety. I'm at the tower I sent you to. Okay. He sounded so calm. I pulled out my binoculars and zoomed in on Tower 2. What I saw scares the shit out of me. It was a creature, looking at me with red glowing eyes. It was waving at me. I was frozen in a state of paralysis, just being watched by this creature. It was weird. It almost looked like something out of a movie or a game. As I started to feel like I could move again, I used it to grab the hunting rifle given to me. I aimed but nothing was there anymore. I sat down and got the flask I hid in my drawer and I took one sip. Then I heard the familiar creak of my tower steps. It was late and no one comes to check up on me at this time. I hid under the bed provided. Who's there? The thing said. 
It sounded like my boss, but I knew it wasn't it. It sounded like a somewhat good impression. I knew it wasn't him when I saw its legs. It had hooves and fur, and I only saw its bottom part. It left. But whatever was there could replicate voices. Whatever it was, I don't know, but that was the one part that almost made me quit. But there are many more reasons. I have been a park ranger in a national park that's located in the United Kingdom, England, for just over 10 years. I'm not going to tell you which one, or even the county of which it's located, for the sake of my job, as I still work here, but there are some pretty weird things that you find every so often while on shift. Things that my superiors would likely not appreciate me sharing online. My job mainly involves patrolling the trails and checking that they're all in a safe state for people to walk through. I was also asked to talk with school children and assemblies and such after about a year or so on the job to express how important it is to stay with the group on the trails. I gave pretty obvious reasons for this, but little did I know, I would soon discover some of the horrifying truths as to why they should never wander off. The first story I'm going to share with you took place on a beautiful spring morning in June, I think. This was during my first year on the job. The sun was still low in the sky, but it was slowly rising and brightening my surroundings. I was on a normal morning patrol through one of the deeper trails as it hadn't been checked recently, and protocol to frequently check all the trails for fallen trees and any potential natural hazards to hikers. It was such a beautiful morning. I remember walking along with a slight smile on my face as I listened to nature, waking up in the trees and I found the cool breeze very relaxing and it had a truly peaceful effect on my mood. Suddenly, the trees to my left were filled with the sounds of birds squawking loudly as they frantically flew away. I stopped and listened for just a moment. Silence. A quote from another story I have read here reads, very true to this situation. Prey is silent when predators are near. Now understand that we don't have any bears or wolves here in England. Nothing like that. So I suppose it could be a deer that had snapped a twig. However, the noise wouldn't usually drop like that, as deer don't pose much of a threat to wildlife at all. I continued on, not thinking anything of it, and after a short time, I got the urge to check behind me. There was a man walking maybe 100 meters back, and I was on a long straight, so it was easy to tell. I was confused as the trails aren't usually used until a little later when early dog walkers would show up, and even then, few would wander this far into the woods at this time. He seemed to be walking at a very relaxed pace, his hands in his dark blue hoodie's pockets, and he had faded blue jeans. I radioed over to ask if anyone had seen someone enter the trail. I was walking shortly after I left, but no one had seen anyone come in or out other than the occasional dog walker. I thought nothing of it, but continued on a slightly hurried pace. I usually wouldn't be bothered about it being out on my own with another stranger. I wasn't a small bloke nor someone to get spooked easily. However, this guy just gave me a bad feeling. I was approaching a gate that leads to a much denser area of the woodland, more like a thick forest, and as I closed the gate behind me, I noticed this man had stopped dead in his tracks. He seemed to be staring right at me, but I couldn't be sure. Then he broke into a sprint, not a light jog that somebody out for exercise might. I'm talking a full-on sprint. It was almost aggressive. I freaked out and turned to run. Why would a complete stranger, who was previously so calm and relaxed, suddenly be sprinting at me? He hadn't called for help or even waved to me. Fortunately, the trail's long straight section was over, and I ran around a curve and hid behind one of the many large rocks that were by the side of the trail. I could hear his heavy footsteps thudding towards me right until he was just on the other side of the rock, and he stopped. Again, dead in his tracks. He wasn't even out of breath. He just seemed to stand there for a while, and then just walked off. 
I waited for what must have been close to 10 minutes to be sure he was far ahead and radioed the strange encounter to my colleagues who agreed it was strange and I cautiously continued on with my patrol. I never saw that strange man again and I hope I never do. I have many more memories I would like to share with you. Stay safe out there. You are rarely truly alone in the forest. I'm back with another story I'd like to share with you. Or rather, I feel the need to share with you as there's nothing I like about it. When someone goes missing in our national parks, the British search and rescue team are contacted immediately. However, they are always at least half an hour's flight away. And even then, they only have so much flight time before they are forced to turn their helicopter around to refuel. This leaves a lot of searching down to the rangers, as we know all of the areas and trails very well. It's always an adrenaline-pumped situation to be in as you never know what the outcome will be. Usually, the helicopter spots the lost people within 20 minutes of joining the search, but then there are the missing people. You should know that between the rangers, we refer to these situations with two categories, lost people and missing people. A lost person is a normal search and rescue scenario. Somebody went down the wrong trail and hasn't been seen in a while, and perhaps thrown a broken leg for good measure. The main thing is that we find them, even if they are a little beaten up. A missing person is somebody who hasn't been seen for anything over a day, or if the situation just seems off. For example, when people just seem to disappear. I have one particular case I'm going to share with you. I will warn you closer to the time, but there is some pretty explicit content in this memory, so here is your far pre-warning. It was a pretty standard shift. The sky was just starting to dim as the sun started sinking towards the horizon, and I was sat in the ranger station, taking calls and checking emails, when a woman comes bursting through the door, absolutely beside herself. Her hair is a mess, with leaves tangled in it. Her makeup is all smudged down and across her face, and her eyes are red from crying. She's telling me that her son had been by her side one minute, and when he went into the bushes, just off the trail for a wee, he never came back. There was no scream, no noise, no nothing. I knew at this instant we had a missing person on our hands, and my heart stopped. A missing child was always bad news, and seldom had a happy ending. He had been in the bush for maybe two minutes when his mother called out to him, and she went running into the woods to try and find him. She was very lucky to have made it back to the trail without getting lost, or worse if you ask me. I tried my best to calm her down and took her to a map and after showing her where our station was, I asked her to try and locate their average location at the time while I made some calls. She protested at first, but after assuring her we had dealt with this kind of situation many times before, she brought herself to trust my instructions and started tracing her tracks on the map. I immediately called the search and rescue team closest to us and told them the exact location was to be confirmed, but to dispatch a helicopter for a missing child. They give us an ETA of 40 minutes. I gather all the rangers on duty, and after confirming with the woman where she believed they were when he disappeared, we all get assigned grids on the map to check and we head out. We are very thorough as we search, and we each square off the grid very effectively and do not leave so much as a rock unturned. So we're getting deeper and deeper into the woods at this point. We'd been searching for a good couple of hours, but the dogs hadn't picked up the boy's scent yet, and we were merely doing a routine comb-styled search. The helicopter was buzzing around, non-stop, and everybody was quiet. No one really spoke much while looking for children. I think it's because of the fact that it's a child we are looking for, not an adult who may be able to look after themselves. I'm getting this heavy, knotted feeling in my gut. You know, the kind you get when you just know that it's going to be a fruitless effort. I should also mention that it's getting dark now, and there's not much light left, 
and what little is left is completely blocked out by the trees. So it's flashlights from here on out. We'll never find this kid, bro, my colleague said in a completely flat voice. Don't talk like that. We never know what we can find while searching. I reply sharply, though deep down in my gut, I knew that child was gone. The helicopter heads back for some more fuel and comes back again. After a further few hours of searching, it is getting very dark and we call it a night as everyone needs to be back before the forest was completely consumed by darkness. The woman stayed in one of the medical beds we had previously prepared for her son, though I doubt she slept at all. I watched the cameras that lay deep in the forest, somewhat in the area the child could have walked in. After an hour or so of nothing, I eventually decide to call it a night. We didn't find this boy the next day, or the day after that, for the matter. Three weeks later, one of our rangers radios that they found the body of the child deep into the woods and that we need to get there, and fast. She sounded worried. A few rangers and I jump into a 4x4 that we used to get deep into the woods quickly, and we make our way to the location described. It's a clearing near an old entrance to a closed-off cave. The trees seem to all lean over towards the cave entrance, as if to be watching intently for whatever is next to climb out. We arrived after a 10 or maybe 15 minute ride. It was one of the most uncomfortable and tense rides of my career, as the vehicle access trail was rarely used as we didn't have much reason to come this far out into the woods, and we've never traveled at this speed. We parked in the clearing and approached what would turn out to be one of the most disturbing experiences of my career. I would like to take this opportunity to warn you that what I describe next could be disturbing to some and cause upset as I can only label it as child abuse. The boy was curled in the fetal position, laid on his left side, and it may have looked as if he died naturally if it wasn't for the huge pool of blood he was laying in, along with the fact that he was completely naked. We rolled his stiff body over onto his back, and I think we all took a step back, as if some force had pushed us all away at the same time. Some sick fuck had sliced his gut open, allowing all of his innards to spill out. But the horror didn't end there. <sighs> oh god no. Please understand that this is not an easy memory for me to recite so forgive me for not going into too much detail, though I doubt I will feel like they missed out. The left everything of this boy was gone. His left eye, his left ear, left testicle, left hand, foot, etc. I was mortified, and I'm not ashamed to say that I threw up violently, almost instantly, upon taking all of this in for a moment. Every cut was very neat and clean, more so than you'd imagine a surgeon can make, especially out in the woods. What was even more horrifying was that the body couldn't have been more than a few days old. Whoever, or whatever for that matter, had taken him, had done this, had kept him hostage for almost three weeks. The thought of how terrified this child must have been still sickens me, even now, nearly seven years on. We called it in an air ambulance and took his body away to be examined by the police and checked for prints. Now we're not really meant to be kept in the loop on following up on investigations after they've left the park. However, the local police officers would tend to update us regularly on the results of these findings. An officer had rung up to update us and his voice sounded dull. He sounded almost as if he was very depressed to be making the call and I can understand why. The post-mortal had revealed that the cuts all seemed to be taken from when the boy was alive. Furthermore, it seemed that there was no traces of food in the boy's stomach, so he clearly wasn't fed either. Apparently, there were more body parts missing, but I just thanked the officer for informing me and hung up the phone, slowly. I sat there for a good 20 minutes, bawling my eyes out before relaying this horrific update to my colleagues. How that little boy didn't die sooner is beyond me. I can't contemplate how this could happen, but whoever or whatever did this is definitely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. That trail was closed off for a good time, 
and there were armed patrols through that area of the woods for nearly four months, following in a desperate attempt to find a trace of who did this, or at least where it happened. We found nothing. Not even the other body parts. They even explored that of the cave that was still quote-unquote safe access, despite it being closed off due to many deaths due to a lack of safety. This is not the only experience of this nature that occurred. However, I'm going to cut it off here. I'm done writing for today as I get emotional, so just allowing the memory to crop back to me. Please, keep your children close by your side, and if they need the toilet, they must either wait or you must accompany them and never stray far from the trail. No more than five meters would be my recommendation. Not unless you know exactly what you're doing. I wasn't sure where else to post these stories, so I figured I'd share them here with you guys. I have been an SAR officer, otherwise known as search and rescue officer, for a few years now, and along the way, I've seen some things that I think you will be interested in hearing. I have a pretty good track record for finding missing peoples. Most of the time, they just wander off the path or slip down a small cliff and can't find their way back. The majority of them have heard the old stay where you are thing and they don't wander far. But I've had two cases where that did not happen. Both bother me a lot and I use them as motivation to search even harder on the missing persons cases I get called on. The first was a little boy who was out berry picking with his parents. He and his sisters were together, and both of them went missing around the same time. Their parents lost sight of them for just a few seconds, and in that time, both of the children apparently wandered off. When their parents couldn't find them, they called us, and we came out to search the area. We found the daughter pretty quickly, and when we asked her where the brother was, she told us that he'd been taken away by the bear man. She said he gave her berries and told her to stay quiet, that he wanted to play with her brother for a while. The last she saw of her brother, he was riding on the shoulders of the bear man and seemed calm. Of course, our first thought was abduction but we never found a trace of another human being in that area. The little girl was also insistent that he was not a normal man, that he was tall and covered in hair like a bear, and that he had a weird looking face. We searched the area for weeks. It was one of the longest calls I've ever been out on, but we never found a single trace of that kid. The other was a young woman who was out hiking with her mom and grandfather. According to the mother, her daughter had climbed up a tree to get a better view of the forest, and she'd never come back down. They waited at the base of the tree for hours, calling her name, before they called for help. Again, we searched everywhere, and we never found a trace of her. I have no idea where she could possibly have gone because neither her mother or grandfather saw her ever come down. A few times, I've been out on my own searching with a canine, and they've tried to lead me straight up cliffs. Not hills, not even rock faces. I'm talking straight, sheer cliffs with no possible handholds. It's always baffling, and in those cases, we usually find the person on the other side of the cliff or miles away from where the canine had originally tried to lead us. I'm sure there's an explanation, but it's sort of strange. One particularly sad case involved the recovery of a body. A nine-year-old girl fell down an embankment and got impaled on a dead tree at the base. It was a complete freak accident, but I'll never forget the sound of her mother when we told her what happened. 
she saw the body bag being loaded into the ambulance, and she let out the most haunting, heartbroken wail I've ever heard in my life. It was like her whole life was crashing down around her, and a part of her had died with her daughter that day. I heard from another SAR officer that she killed herself a few weeks after it happened. She couldn't live with the loss of her daughter. I was teamed up with another SAR officer because we'd received reports of bears in the area. We were looking for a guy who hadn't come home from a climbing trip when he was supposed to, and we ended up having to do some serious climbing just to get where we figured he'd be. We found him trapped in a small crevice with a broken leg. It was not pleasant. He'd been there for almost two days, and his leg was obviously very infected. We were able to get him into a chopper, and I heard from one of the EMTs that the guy was absolutely inconsolable. He kept talking about how he'd be doing fine, and when he'd gotten to the top, a man had been there. He said the guy had no climbing equipment, and he was wearing a parka and ski pants. He walked up to the guy, and when the guy turned around, he said he had no face, it was just blank. He freaked out and ended up trying to get off the mountain too fast, which is why he'd fallen. He said he could hear the guy all night, climbing down the mountain and letting out these horrified, muffled screams. The story bothered the hell out of me. I'm glad I was not there to hear it firsthand. One of the scariest things I've ever had happen to me involved a search for a young woman who'd gotten separated from her hiking group. We were out until late one night because the dogs had picked up her scent. When we found her, she was curled up under a large rotted log. She was missing her shoes and pack, and she was clearly in shock. She did not have any injuries, and we were able to get her to walk with us back to the base ops. Along the way, she kept looking behind us, asking us why that big man with black eyes was following us. We couldn't see anyone, so we just wrote it off as some weird symptom of shock. But the closer we got to the base, the more agitated this woman got. She kept asking me to tell him to stop making faces at her. At one point, she stopped and turned around and started yelling into the forest, saying that she wanted him to leave her alone. She wasn't going to go with him, she said, and she wouldn't give us to him. We finally got her to keep moving, but we started hearing these weird noises coming from all around us. It was almost like coughing, but more rhythmic and deeper. It was almost insect-like. I don't really know how else to describe it. When we were within sight of base ops, the woman turns to me, and her eyes are about as wide as I can imagine a human could open them up. She touches my shoulder and says, He says to tell you to speed up. He doesn't like looking at the scar on your neck. I have a very small scar on the base of my neck, but it's mostly hidden under my collar, and I have no idea how this woman saw it. Right after she said it, I heard that weird coughing right in my ear, and I just about jumped out of my skin. I hustled to her ops, trying not to show how freaked out I was, but I have to say I was really happy when we left the area that night. This is the last one I'll tell you, and it's probably the weirdest story I have. Now, I don't know if this is true in every search and rescue unit, but in mine, it's sort of an unspoken, regular thing we run into. You can try asking it about other SAR officers, but even if they know what you're talking about, they probably won't say anything about it. We've been told to not talk about it by our superiors. And at this point, we've all gotten so used to it that it doesn't even seem weird anymore at all. On just about every case where we're really far into the wilderness, I'm talking 30 or 40 miles at some point, we'll find a staircase in the middle of the woods. It's almost like if you took the stairs in your house 
cut them out, and put them in the forest. I asked about it the first time I saw some, and the other officer just told me not to worry about it, that it was a normal occurrence. Everyone I asked said the same thing. I wanted to go check them out, but I was told, very empathetically, that I should never go near any of them. I just sort of ignore them now when I run into them because it happens so frequently. I have a lot more stories, and I suppose if anyone's interested, I'll tell them. So I logged back on tonight and was blown away by the staggering amount of interest this seems to have generated. First off, I'll address a few things that you guys have brought up. There's been an overwhelming amount of people mentioning the similarity between some of my stories and those of David Polites. I assure you I'm not trying to rip him off in any way. I've got nothing but respect for the guy. He's actually what inspired me to write this, because I can verify a lot of the things he talks about. We do have a lot of these strange missing persons cases, and most of the time, they aren't solved. Either that, or we find them in places they have no business being. I personally haven't been on many calls like that, but I'll share a few that I've seen, and a story my friend told me that relates to this. There was a lot of feedback about the stairs, so I'll touch on that briefly here, and I'll also include a story. They come in a variety of shapes, sizes, styles, and conditions. Some are pretty dilapidated, just ruins, but others are brand new. I saw one that looked like they came from a lighthouse. They were metal and spiral, almost old-fashioned. The stairs didn't go up infinitely, or farther than I could see, but some sets are taller than others. Like I said before, just imagine the stairs in your house, as if someone cut and pasted them in the middle of nowhere. I don't have any pictures. It's never really occurred to me to try again after the first time, and I don't really feel like risking my job over it. I'll try again in the future, but I can't really promise anything. A few people expressed confusion about the guy who ran into the man with no face. Just to clarify, when the climber ascended and reached the top of this peak, he saw another man in a parka and ski pants. This was the man with no face. Sorry about the confusing wording of that story. I'll try to avoid that in the future. Alright, on to the new stories. As far as missing persons go, I'd say about half the calls I get are related to that. The others are rescue calls. People who fall down from cliffs and hurt themselves, get injured by fire, which you wouldn't believe how often this happens, mostly drunken kids, get bitten or stung by animals or insects. We're a pretty tight team and we have veterans who are excellent at finding signs of lost people. That's what makes these cases where we never find any trace of them so frustrating. One in particular was upsetting for all of us because we did find a trace of them, but it just led to more questions than answers. An older man had been hiking alone on a well-established trail, but his wife called to say that he hadn't come home and when he should have. Apparently, he had had a history of seizures and she was worried that he had not taken his medication and had suffered one out on the trail. Before you ask, I have no idea why he thought it was okay to go out alone, or why she didn't go with him. I don't ask about that kind of thing because, past a certain point, it really does not matter. Someone is missing and it's my job to find them. We went out in standard search formation, and it wasn't long before one of our vets found signs that the guy had gone off the trail. We grouped up and followed him, spreading out in a fan to make sure we were covering as much ground as possible. Suddenly, a call comes over the radio telling us to all head back into the vet's location, and we come right away, 
because this usually means the missing person is injured and we need a full team to help them get out safely. We meet back up and the vet is just standing at the base of a tree with his hands on the side of his head. I ask my buddy what's going on and he points up into the branches of this tree. I almost couldn't believe what I was seeing, but there's a walking stick dangling from a branch at least 30 feet off the ground. The little strap thing on the handle had been looped around the branch, and it's just hanging there. There's no way the guy could have tossed it up into the air that far, and we don't see any other signs that he's still in the area. We call up into the tree, but it's obvious no one's in it. We're all just sort of left scratching our heads. We keep searching for the guy, but we never find him. We even bring our canines out, but they lose his scent long before this tree. Eventually, the search is called off because there are other calls we have to attend to, and past a certain point, there's not much we can do. The guy's wife called us every day for months, asking if we'd found her husband, and it was heartbreaking to hear her get more and more hopeless each time. I'm not sure why this call in particular was so upsetting, but I think it was just the sheer improbability of it. That and the questions that were raised. How the hell did this guy's cane end up in a tree? Did someone kill him and toss that up there as some sort of weird trophy? We did our best to find him, but it was almost like a taunt. We still talk about that one from time to time. Missing kids are the most heartbreaking. Doesn't matter what circumstances they go missing under, it's never easy and we always, always dread the ones we find deceased. It's not common but it does happen. David Polites talks a lot about kids search and rescue teams finding in places they shouldn't be or couldn't be. I can honestly say I've heard about this kind of thing happening more than I've personally seen it, but I'll share one of the ones I think about a lot that I witnessed personally. A mother and her three kids were out for a picnic in an area of the park that has a small lake. One is six, one is five, and the other is about three years old. She's watching them all really closely, and according to her, she never lets them out of her sight at any given time. She never saw anyone else in the area either, which is important. She packs their stuff up and they start to head back to the parking area. Now this lake is only about two miles into the woods and it's on a very clearly established trail. It's almost impossible to get lost getting from the parking area to the lake, unless you're deliberately going off the path like an imbecile. Her kids are walking in front of her when she hears what sounds like someone coming up the path behind her. She turns around and in the four or so seconds she's not looking, her five-year-old son vanishes. She figures he'd step off the trail to pee or something, and she asks her other two where he went. They both tell her that a big man with a scary face came out of the woods next to them, took the kid's hand, and led him into the trees. The two remaining kids don't seem upset. In fact, she later says that it seems like they'd been drugged. They're sort of spacey and fuzzy, so of course she freaks out starts looking frantically in the area for her kid. She's screaming his name, and she says at one point she thinks she heard him answer her. Now, obviously, she can't go blindly running into the woods. She's got two other kids. So she calls the police, and they send us out immediately. We respond, and we start the search for him. Over the course of this search, which spans miles, we never find a single trace of the kid. Canines can't pick up any scent. We don't find any clothing or broken bushes or literally anything that would signify a child ever being there. Of course, there's suspicion about the mother for a while, 
but it's pretty clear that she's completely destroyed by the whole thing. We looked for this kid for weeks, with a lot of volunteer help too, but eventually, the search peters out, and we have to move on. The volunteers keep searching though, and one day we get a call on the radio letting us know that a body had been found and needs to be recovered. They tell us the location, and none of us can believe it. We figured it had to be a different kid, but we go out there, about 15 miles from the site where he vanished, and sure enough, we find the body of the kid we've been looking for. I have been trying to figure out how this kid got where he did ever since we found him, and I've never come up with an answer. A volunteer just happened to be in the area, because he figured he might as well look in places that no one else would think to on the off chance the body had been dumped. He comes to the base of a tall, rocky slope, and halfway up, he sees something. He looks through his binoculars, and sure enough, it's the body of a little boy, stuffed in a little opening in the rock. He recognizes the color of the kid's shirt, so he knows right away that it's the missing boy. That's when he calls it in, and we're dispatched. It took us almost an hour to get his body down, and none of us could believe what we were seeing. Not only was this kid 15 miles from where he'd started, there was no possible way he could have gotten up there on his own. This slope is treacherous, and it's hard for even us with our climbing gear on. A five-year-old boy had no way of getting up there, it's impossible. Of that I'm certain. Not only that, but the kid doesn't even have a scratch on him. His shoes are gone, but his feet aren't damaged or even dirty, so it wasn't as if an animal dragged him up there. And from what we can tell, he hasn't been dead that long. He'd been out there for over a month by that point, and it looked like he'd only been dead for, at most, a day or two. The whole thing was unbelievably strange and was one of the most disturbing calls I'd ever been on. We found out later that the coroner determined the child had died from exposure. He'd frozen to death, probably late at night, two days before we found him. There were no suspects, there were no answers. To date, it's one of the weirdest things I have ever seen. One of my first jobs as a trainee was a search op for a four-year-old kid that had gotten separated from his mom. This was one of those cases where we knew we were going to find him because the dogs were on a strong scent trail and we saw clear signs that he was in the area. We ended up finding him in a berry patch about half a mile from where he'd been last seen at. The kid wasn't even aware that he'd wandered that far. One of the vets brought him back, which I was glad for because I'm not really good with kids and I find it hard to talk to them and keep them company. As my trainer and I are headed back, she decides to take me on a detour to show me one of the hot spots where we tend to find missing people. It's a natural dip in the land near a popular trail, and people will usually move downhill because it's easier. We hike out there. It's a few miles away, and we get there in about a half hour or so. As we're walking around the area, she's pointing out places that she's found people in the past. I see something in the distance. Now, this area we're in is about 8 miles from the main parking area, though there is back roads you can take to get closer if you don't want to hike in that far. But we're on state protected land, which means there can't be any kind of commercial or residential development out here. The most you'll ever see is a fire tower or makeshift shelter that homeless people think they can get away with building. But I could see from here that whatever this thing is has straight edges, and if there's one thing you learn quickly, it's that nature rarely makes straight lines. I point it out, but she doesn't say anything. She just hangs back and lets me wander over and check it out. I get within about 20 feet of it, and all the hair on the back of my neck stands up. It's a staircase in the middle of the woods. In the proper context, it would literally be the most benign thing ever. It's just a staircase with beige carpet 
and about ten steps tall. But instead of being in a house, where it obviously should be, it's out here in the middle of the woods. The sides aren't carpeted, obviously, and I could see the wood it's made out of. It's almost like a video game glitch, where the house has failed to load completely and the stairs are the only thing visible. I stand there, and it's like my brain is working overtime to try and make sense of what I'm seeing. My trainer comes and stands next to me, and she just stands there casually looking at it as if it's the least interesting thing in the world. I ask her what this is doing here, and she just chuckles. Get used to it, rookie. You're going to see a lot of them. I start to move closer, but she grabs my arm. Hard. I wouldn't do that, she said. Her voice so casual, but her grip is tight, and I stand there looking at her. You're going to see them all the time, but don't go near them. Do not touch them. Do not go up them. Just ignore them. I start to ask her about it, but something in the way she's looking at me tells me that it's best if I don't and just leave it. We end up moving on, and the subject doesn't come up again for the rest of my training. She was right though. I'd say about every fifth call I go on, I end up running across a set of stairs. Sometimes they're relatively close to the path, maybe within two or three miles. Sometimes they're twenty, thirty, forty miles out, literally in the middle of nowhere, and I only find them during the broadest searches of training weekends. They're usually in good condition, but sometimes it looks like they've been out there for miles. All different kinds, all different sizes. The biggest I ever saw looked like they came out of a turn-of-the-century mansion and were at least 10 feet wide, with steps leading up at least 15 or 20 feet. I've tried talking about it with people, but they just give me the same response my trainer did. It's normal. Don't worry about it. They're not a big deal. But don't go close to them, or up them. When trainees ask me about it, I give them the same response. I don't really know what else to tell them. I'm really hoping that someday I do get a better answer, but it has not happened yet. This is another one that was less spooky and more sad. A young man went missing late in winter, when realistically no one should be going that far out onto the trails. We close a lot of them, but some remain open year-round unless there's a shitload of snow. We did an operation for him, and we had about six feet of snow on the ground since it was unusually heavy snow this year, and we knew it wasn't likely that we'd find him until spring when the thaw came. Sure enough, when the first big thaw came, a hiker reported a body a little ways off the main trail. We found him at the base of a tree in a pile of melted snow. I knew right away what had happened, and it scared the living hell out of me. Most of you who ski or snowboard or spend any time on the mountain will probably have guessed too. When snow falls, it doesn't collect as thick in the areas beneath the branches. It happens with most fir trees, because they have a sort of closed umbrella shape. So what you end up with is space around the base of the tree that's filled with a mixture of loose, powdery snow, air, and branches. They're called tree wells, and they're not immediately obvious if you don't know what you're looking for. We've put up signs in the welcome center, big ones, letting people know how dangerous they are. But every year that we get an unusual amount of snow, at least one person doesn't read them or doesn't take the warning seriously, and we find out about it in the spring. My best guess is that this young man was hiking and got tired, or maybe a cramp from walking in the deep snow. He went to go sit at the base of the tree, not knowing that there was a tree well, and fell in. He got stuck with his feet up, and the surrounding snow caved in around him. Unable to free himself, he suffocated. It's called snow immersion suffocation, and it doesn't usually happen except in really deep snow. But if you get stuck in a weird position, like this guy did, 
even six feet of snow can be lethal. What scared me the most was imagining how he must have struggled, upside down in the freezing cold. He didn't die quickly. The snow would have formed a dense, heavy pile on top of him, and it would have been literally impossible to get out. As it got harder to breathe, he would have known what was happening. I can't even imagine what he was thinking in his last moments. A lot of my outdoorsy friends want to know if I've ever seen the goat man while I've been out on calls. Unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, I've never had anything quite like that happen. I guess the closest was the whole black-eyed man thing, but I didn't see anything. However, there was one call where I had something, some kind of similar thing happened, but I'm not willing to chalk it up to the goat man. We'd gotten a report that an older woman had fainted along one of the trails and needed assistance getting back down to the main area. We hike up to where she's at and her husband is just beside himself. He runs, well, I guess more jogs to us and tells us that he was a little ways off the trail looking at something when his wife starts screaming behind him. He runs back to her and she's passed out on the trail. We get her on backboard, and as we're getting her down the welcome center, she comes to and starts screaming again. I calm her down and ask her what had happened. I can't remember verbatim what she said, but essentially what happened was this. She'd been waiting for her husband when she started hearing this really strange sound. She said it sounded sort of like a cat, but it was off somehow, and she couldn't quite figure out why. She went a little ahead to try and hear it better, and it sounded like it was coming closer. She said the closer it got, the more uneasy she was until she finally figured out what was wrong. I do remember this next part, because it was so weird that I don't think I could have forget if I tried. It wasn't a cat, it was a man, saying the word meow over and over, just meow, meow, meow. But it wasn't a man. It couldn't have been, because I've never heard a man make his voice buzz like that did. I thought my hearing aid was going out, but it wasn't. I adjusted it and it still sounded all buzzy. It was awful. He was coming closer, but I could not see him. And the closer he got, the more scared I was. And the last thing I remember was a shape coming out of the trees. I guess that's when I fainted. Now, obviously, I'm a little perplexed as to why a guy would be out in the middle of the woods chanting meow meow at people. So once we get down the mountain, I tell my superior that I'm going to go search the area to see if I can find anything. He gives me the go ahead and I grab a radio and hike back to where she fainted. I don't see anyone, so I keep going about a mile more. And when I head back, I go off the trail to see if I can figure out where she saw him coming from. It's almost sunset by this point, and I don't have any desire to be out at night alone. So I just sort of write it off and make a mental note to check it out again tomorrow. But as I'm headed back, I start to hear something in the distance. I stop, and I call out for anyone in the immediate area to identify themselves. The sound did not come closer or even get louder, but it sounded exactly like a man saying meow, meow, in this really odd monotone. As comical as it makes it sound, it was almost like that guy on South Park with the electrolarynx. Ned, I think. I go off the trail in the direction I think it's coming from, but I never seem to get closer. It's almost like it's coming from all directions. Eventually, it just sort of fades out, and I ended up going back to the welcome center. I didn't get any further reports like that, and even though I went back to that area, I never heard that exact sound again. I suppose it could have been some stupid kid out there messing with people, but even I have to admit, it was weird. So. This kind of turned into a massive wall of text, and for that I apologize. I wanted to get the stories that my friend told me, and he does have some good ones, so I'll be sharing those with you guys soon. I also have a few more of my own I think you will like. 
I hope you all enjoyed part one of these terrifying search and rescue stories. Keep a lookout for part two coming in the next couple of days. In the meantime, if you enjoy my content, like, subscribe, and comment, and I'll be seeing you all very soon. <laughs>
Now, I've seen dead bodies before, but something about this whole situation hits me hard. I have to take a second to compose myself, and I get up and go get one of the other vets who were standing by. I tell him that it's a dead kid, and he sort of pats my shoulder and tells me he'll deal with it. It took us over an hour to get this woman to let us see her kid. Every time we try to take him from her, she just flips out and tells us we can't have him, that he'll be okay if we just leave her alone and let her help him. But eventually, one of the vets manages to calm her down and she gives us the body. We took it back to the med area, but when the EMT showed up, they told us that there was never any hope of saving the child. He died instantly from the trauma to his head. I was good buddies with one of the nurses who met them at the hospital. She told me later on what had happened. Turns out the couple had been walking with the baby in the sling, and they stopped because the kid was fussing. The dad takes the kid and is holding him, looking out over this little goalie by the path. The mom comes to stand next to him, but she ends up stepping on a loose patch of soil and she trips. She falls into the dad who drops the kid, who ends up falling about 20 feet down this little gully onto the rocks at the very bottom. The dad climbed down and recovered the kid, but he'd fallen right on his head and was dead by the time he got there. The baby was only about 15 months old. It was a total freak accident. A series of events that all compiled into the worst possible outcome. Probably one of the more awful calls I've been on. I haven't seen a whole lot of animal bites in my time as a search and rescue officer, mostly because there aren't that many animals that come around the area. While there are bears in the area, they tend to stay pretty far away from people, and sightings are highly unusual. Most of the animals you'll see are small ones, like coyotes, raccoons, or skunks. What we do see frequently, though, are moose. And let me tell you, moose are nasty. They'll chase after anything, for any reason, and God help you if you get in between a female and its baby. One of the more amusing calls was a guy who'd gotten chased down by an absolutely massive male moose and was stuck in a tree took us almost an hour to get him down, and when he was finally on solid ground again, he looks at me and says, Damn, them fuckers is big up close. I guess that's not really scary, but we still laugh about that one. I honestly don't know how I'd forgotten this story, but it is by far the scariest thing that's happened to me. I guess maybe I've tried so long to forget about it that it just didn't come to mind right away. As someone who spends literally all of their time in the wilderness, you don't ever want to let yourself get scared of being alone, or out in the middle of nowhere. That's why when you have experiences like this, you tend to just forget about them and move on. This is, to date, the only thing that's ever made me really seriously consider if this job is the right one for me. I don't really like talking about it much, but I'll do the best I can to remember it all. As I recall, this took place right at the end of spring. It was a typical lost child call. A four-year-old little girl had wandered away from her family's campsite and had been missing for about two hours. Her parents were completely despondent and told us what most parents do. My kid would never wander away. She's so good about staying close and she's never done anything like this before. We assure the parents that we'll do everything we can to find her and we spread out in a standard search formation. I was partnered with one of my good buddies, and we were sort of casually holding conversation while we hiked. I know it sounds callous, but you do sort of become desensitized once you've done this long enough. It just becomes the norm. And I think to a certain extent, you have to learn to desensitize yourself in order to work this job. We search for a good two hours going well beyond where we think she'd be, and we come out of a small valley when something makes us both stop in unison. We freeze and look at each other, and there's almost a sensation like a plane depressurizing. My ears pop, and I have this odd sensation of having dropped about 10 feet. I start to ask my buddy if he felt that, but before I can, 
we hear the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. It's almost like a freight train passing directly by us, but it's coming from every direction at once, including above and below us. He screams something to me, but I can't hear him over this deafening roar. Understandably freaked out, we look all around us, trying to find the source of the sound, but neither of us sees anything. Of course, my first thought is a landslide, but we're not near any cliffs, and even if we were, it would have hit us by now. The sound goes on and on, and we're trying to yell to each other, but even standing close together, we can't hear anything but this sound. Then suddenly, as it starts, it stops, like someone threw a switch and cut it off. We stand there for a second, perfectly still, and slowly the normal sounds of the woods come back. He asks me what the hell just happened, but I just kind of shrug and we stand there looking at each other for a minute. I get on the radio and ask if anyone else just heard the end of the world, but no one hears it, even though we're all within shouting distance of each other. My buddy and I just sort of shrug it off and keep going. About an hour later, we all check up on the radios and no one has found the little girl. Most of the time, we won't search when it gets dark, but because we don't have any kind of lead on her, a few of us decide to keep going, including me and my buddy. We keep close together and we're calling out for her every couple of minutes. At this point, I'm hoping beyond hope that we find her, because while I may not like kids, the idea of them being out all alone in the dark is awful. The woods can be intimidating to kids in the daylight. At night, well, it's a whole different beast. But we're not seeing any signs of her or getting any responses. And around midnight, we decide to turn around and head back to the rendezvous point. We're about halfway back when my buddy stops and shines his light right in front of us into a really thick deadfall, a group of dead trees. I ask him if he's heard a response, but he just told me to be quiet a second and listen. I do, and in the distance, I could hear what sounded like a kid crying. We both call the girl's name and listen for any kind of response but it's just this really faint crying. We head in the direction of this deadfall and go around it, calling her name over and over. As we get closer to the crying, I start getting this weird feeling in my gut, and I tell my buddy that something isn't right. He tells me he feels the same way, but we can't figure out what it is. We stop where we are and call the girl's name again, and at the same time, we both figure it out. The crying is on a loop. It's the same little hitching sob, then wail, then quiet hiccup, repeated over and over. It's exactly the same every time, and without saying another word, we both take off running. It's the only time I've ever lost my composure like that, but something about it was so incredibly wrong, and neither of us wanted to stay out there anymore. When we got back to the rendezvous, we asked if anyone else had heard of anything strange, but no one else had knew what we were talking about. I know it sounds sort of anticlimactic, but the call effed me up for a long time. As for the little girl, we never found a trace of her. We keep an eye out for her and all the other people who've never found, but frankly, I doubt we'll ever find anything. Of the missing person's calls I've gone out on, only a handful have ever resulted in a complete disappearance, meaning no trace of the person and nobody ever found. But sometimes, finding a body just leads to more questions than answers. Here are some of the bodies we've found that have become infamous in our team. Number 1. A teenage boy whose remains were recovered almost a year after he vanished. We found the top of his skull two finger bones and his camera almost 40 miles from where he was last seen. The camera, sadly, was destroyed. Number 2. The pelvis of an older man who had vanished a month earlier. That was all we found. Number 3. The lower jaw and right foot of a two-year-old boy on the highest peak of a ridge in the southern part of the park. Number 4 the body of a 10-year-old girl with Down syndrome 
almost 20 miles away from where she'd vanished. She had died of exposure three weeks after going missing, and all of her clothes were intact except for her shoes and jacket. There were berries and cooked meat in her stomach when they did the autopsy. The coroner said it appeared as if someone had been taking care of her. There were no suspects ever identified. The frozen body of a one-year-old baby, found a week after vanishing in the hollow trunk of a tree ten miles from the area he was last seen. There was fresh milk found in his stomach, but his tongue was gone. A single vertebrae and right kneecap of a three-year-old girl, found in the snow almost twenty miles from the campground of her family, had been at the previous summer. Now on to a couple of other stories my friend told me. I mentioned that you all were interested in the stairs and you're in luck. He's had a closer encounter with them. Though, he doesn't have any real explanation for them. He does have a bit more experience with them than I do. My buddy has been a search and rescue officer for about seven years. He started when he was a junior in college, and he had a very similar experience when he first encountered the stairs. His trainer told him almost the same thing mine did, which was to never go near, touch, or ascend them. For the first year, he did just that, but apparently his curiosity got the better of him, and on one call, he broke away from the line and went to go check out a set of them. He said they were about 10 miles from the path where a teenage girl had vanished, and the dogs were following a scent. He was on his own, lagging behind the main group when he saw a set of stairs off to his left. They looked like they were from a new house, because the carpeting was pristine and white. He said that as he got closer, he didn't feel any different or hear any weird noises. He was expecting something to happen, like bleeding from his ears or collapsing, but he got right up next to them and didn't feel anything. The only thing, he said, that was odd was that there was absolutely no debris on the steps, no dirt, leaves, rust, anything, and there didn't appear to be any signs of animals or insect activity in the immediate area, which he found strange. It was like things were avoiding them, and more like they had just happened to be in a relatively barren part of the forest. He touched the stairs and didn't feel anything except that sort of sticky feeling you get from new carpet. Making sure his radio was on, he slowly ascended the stairs. He said it was scary because the way they'd been stigmatized, he wasn't really sure what was going to happen. He joked that half of him expected to be teleported to some other dimension, and the other half was watching for a UFO to come swooping down. But he got to the top with little event, and he stood there looking around. But he said, the longer he stood on the top step, the more he felt like he was doing something very, very wrong. He described it as the feeling you'd get if you were in a part of the government building you had no business being in, as if someone was going to come and arrest you, or shoot you in the back of the head at any second. He tried to brush it off, but the feeling only got stronger and stronger, and that's when he realized that he couldn't hear anything anymore. The sounds of the forest were gone, and he couldn't even hear his own breathing. It was like some kind of weird, awful tinnitus, but more oppressive. He climbed back down and rejoined the search, and didn't mention what he'd done. But, he said, the weirdest part came after. His trainer was waiting back at the welcome center after the search ended for the day, and he cornered my buddy before he could leave. He said his trainer had this look of intense anger and asked what was wrong. You went up them, didn't you? My buddy said it wasn't phrased as a question. He asked how his trainer knew. The trainer just shook his head. Because we didn't find her. The dogs lost her scent. My buddy asked what that had to do with anything. The trainer asked how long he'd been on the stairs, and my buddy said no more than a minute. The trainer gave him this really awful, almost dead-eyed look and told him that if he'd ever went up another set of stairs, he'd be fired immediately. The trainer walked away 
and I guess he's never answered any of the questions my buddy asked him about it since. My buddy has been involved in a lot of missing persons cases where there's never been a trace of them found. I mentioned David Polites, and my buddy said that he can confirm that those stories are, for the most part, accurate. He said that most of the time, if the person is not found right away, they're either never found, or they're found weeks, months, or even years later, in places they can't have possibly ever gotten to. One story he told me that was really standing out was it involved a five-year-old boy with a severe mental disability. The little boy vanished from a picnic area in the late fall. In addition to the disability, he was also physically handicapped, and his parents explained over and over that he simply could not have vanished. It was impossible. Someone had to have taken him. My buddy said they searched for this kid for weeks, going miles out of the accepted range, but it was like he'd never been there. The dogs could not pick up his scent anywhere, not even in the picnic area where he'd apparently vanished from. Suspicion fell on the parents, but it was pretty clear that they were devastated and hadn't done anything sinister to their child. The search was concluded about a month later, and my buddy said everyone had pretty much forgotten it by later in the winter. He was out on a training op in the snow, on one of the higher peaks, when he came across something in the snow. He said he saw it from far away at first, and when he got closer, he realized it was a shirt, frozen and sticking partway out of the powder. He recognized it as belonging to the kid, because it had a distinctive pattern. About 20 yards away, he found the child's body, lying partially buried in the snow. My buddy said there was no way the kid had been dead for more than a few days, and even though he'd been missing for almost three months, the kid was curled around something, and when my buddy brushed off the snow to see what it was, he said he almost couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was a big chunk of ice that had been carved crudely to look sort of like a person. The kid was holding it so tight that it had frost bitten his chest and hands, which my buddy could tell even with the decay that had taken place. He radioed the rest of the crew, and they took the body off the mountain. Now, he recapped all of this for me, and to put it simply, there was no way this kid could have both survived for almost three months on his own, or have gotten to this peak. There was no physical way this child could have walked almost 50 miles and ended up at the top of a damn mountain. To top it off, there was nothing in the kid's stomach or colon. Nothing, not even water. It was like he said, the kid had been taken off the face of the earth, put in suspended animation, and dropped on this mountain months later, only to die of exposure. He's never really gotten over that one. The last story I'll share from him was the one that took place relatively recently, only a few months ago. They were out doing a recon for mountain lions because there had been several reports of sightings in the last couple of days. One of our jobs is to scout out the areas where these animals are seen to ensure that if they are in the area, we can warn people and close off those trails. He was out on his own in a very heavily forested part of the park toward dusk when he heard what sounded like a woman screaming in the distance. Now, as most of you know, when a mountain lion screams, it sounds almost exactly like a woman being brutally murdered. It's unsettling, but far from abnormal. My buddy radioed back and let the ops know that he had heard one, and that he was going to keep going to see if he could figure out where its territory started. He heard the mountain lion scream a couple more times, always the same spot, and determine the approximate area of the mountain lion's territory. He was about to head back when he heard another scream, this time only within a few yards of him. Of course, he freaks out and starts heading back at a much faster pace. Because the last thing he wants is to run into a damn mountain lion and get mauled to death. As he got back on the path and started heading back, the screaming followed him and he broke into a jog. He was about a mile from Ops and the screaming had stopped and he turned around to see if it was following him. It was almost night by this point, but he said in the distance, just before the path rounded a corner, 
he could see what looked like a male figure. He called out to them, warning them that the paths were closed and that he needed to come back to the welcome center. The figure just stood there, and my buddy started to walk over. When he was about 10 yards away, the figure took, as he described, an impossibly long step toward him and let out the same scream my buddy had been hearing. My buddy didn't even say anything. He just turned and sprinted back to the ops, never looking behind him. By the time he got back, the screaming had moved back into the woods. He didn't mention it to anyone else. He just said that there was a mountain lion in the area and that they would need to close those paths until the animal could be located and moved. I'm going to end this entry here since it's turned into a huge wall of text. I'm going to be heading out on a yearly training op tomorrow morning, so I'll be gone until early next week. I'll be meeting with a lot of former trainers and buddies who work in other areas of the park, and I'll be asking around about any stories they'd like to share. I'm so glad you guys have been interested in my stories, and once I'm back from this, I'll continue to share them with you.